it's very difficult to, to, to do justice to uh, such an interesting and complex book in such a short time, but I think you've done very well. Let me just follow up with one question, then I'm going to turn to the panelists. Um, your subtitle uh, for this book is America's Grand Strategist. Uh, I think you would agree that there was another American grand strategist, as well as Brzezinski, in many ways uh, similar and in many ways very different, and that is, of course, Henry Kissinger. And even though I promise this wasn't about Henry Kissinger, I think it would be interesting uh, if you would, because you'd certainly do it in the book, to, uh, to compare and contrast uh, the two, because I think it illuminates the, the important differences between uh, Zbig and, and uh, Kissinger. Uh, yes, it's a fascinating uh, subject to compare the uh, intellectual approaches. So the two men certainly uh, paid a lot of attention to history and indeed were uh, uh, very well uh, versed uh, in uh, uh, the history of international relations, but their approach was strikingly uh, uh, different in the sense that uh, for Kissinger what mattered was relations among states, uh, the role of great powers and great men, including himself, uh, and the, also the uh, idea that you had uh, rules of international relations that did not really uh, change that much over time and that in the Westphalian system, uh, you could see them uh, pretty much constant between the 19th century and the uh, 20th uh, century. And so he was interested in, in uh, 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 more in these sort of immutable uh, laws of, uh, uh, of diplomacy, whereas uh, Brzezinski paid much more attention to change to other forces than just uh, great men and great uh, powers. Uh, he paid a lot of attention to so what he called social awakening, things like the Arab Spring. He paid attention to the media, uh, to issues like climate. So when the two of them met for the last time uh, in December 2016, so a year and a half ago, uh, not even, uh, that was in Oslo, uh, the two speeches really reflected that difference with uh, uh, Zbig, of course, uh, paying attention to uh, geopolitics and to the great game, as the uh, title of one of his uh, most famous book uh, goes, but also to other issues like uh, climate, like economics, like social forces, uh, etc. And I think it's in this uh, 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 it's most uh, it's really the heart of the contrast also Kissinger was more uh, geared toward the I would say the past whereas as I mentioned uh, Brzezinski was always interested uh, in the future and trying to decipher trying to uh, analyze uh, the world to come in order to make the best uh, strategic recommendations thanks for Stan I'd like to bring the other panelists in by just asking each one of them we'll start with Frank um, what was your take on the book what did you find uh, kind of most interesting from your perspective. Sure, and, and thank you, uh, Marty. This uh, was an amazing book. Just, I was actually happy you ended with the Oslo incident. I will tell you that um, Kissinger was very nervous about that. Uh, Olav Nostad, who hosted it, is an, an old friend, and it turns out they actually had to flip a coin to see who would speak first. At that point, their rivalry had gone for that long, and they actually flipped a coin um, I will also say uh, uh, Kissinger had mentioned to me after Brzezinski's passing that you get to that age and you lose most of your friends. He said it affected him far more than any. I mean, he, and he got very personal about it. And it's very clear, and it comes through very nicely in your book about their parallel uh, sort of lives, which I think is interesting. I mean, it is a tremendous book. It's really three books in one. It's a history of an extraordinary man. It's uh, a narrative of the tragedy and triumph of American foreign policy uh, in the second half of the 20th century. But the third part of the book, I think, is to me the most interesting, and that is about the role of ideas in policy. That is what I came uh, away from, uh, who generated these ideas and how that changed in the 20th century. Justin does an extraordinary job of charting how the United States moves from this establishment of financiers and lawyers and industrialists uh, to this new type of person, which Brzezinski and his constant shadow Kissinger represent, the savvy, ambitious, um, brilliant academic slash policy uh, entrepreneur. And I think perhaps the most jarring part of this book is just asking the question, how much do those ideas matter? 
and to what extent to the institutions that support and create these ideas, whether they be think tanks or whether they be universities, um, how they contribute uh, to all of this. And I think that is, it's uncomfortable and awkward, certainly for someone who's part of a Cold War university and for other people who are part of think tanks, but I think we should take this seriously and discuss it. And I think that part of the book really stood out for me. Great. Uh, we will get back to this question of do ideas matter. Uh, Mary, mm -hmm. please. Yes, I just want to second what Frank has said. It, it is a remarkable book. I learned new things on every page, whether it was about the nature of the Cold War University or generally or specifically the story of how the United States on Zbigniew's watch had a mole on the Polish military staff and used to give a solidarity advance warning of when crackdowns was coming, thus foiling those crackdowns. And Zabig was horrified when, after Reagan took office, the Reagan administration failed to give information that it had to solidarity and therefore uh, enabled the, the military crackdown to succeed. And a generation of leaders of solidarity went to jail. And Zabig couldn't believe this, especially as the president was supposedly such a staunch anti-communist. And of course, this was all classified at the time, so he couldn't say this publicly, but he was very active behind the scenes. That's just one of the many rich details that I learned from this book. And as a historian of the Cold War, I, I thought I knew a lot, but there was a lot more to learn. So I recommend that you, you, you charge the table at the back of the room and buy the book. It is extremely interesting. Uh, I had just uh, I had three bigger questions uh, for you or for the table. The first was that I noticed you changed the subtitle from the French to the English edition. Uh, a more accurate translation would have been something like imperial strategist or strategist of empire. Uh, that is not currently the subtitle. <laughs> so I'm wondering if you think our American sensitivities are such that we couldn't bear that or, or if the translator twisted your arm. So I would just appreciate hearing why the title was finessed for the English uh, language edition first. Uh, second, uh, just generally, one of the parts of the book that appealed to me quite a lot, and I'd like to give you a chance to talk more about this, is the way that you endorse uh, Brzezinski's questioning of grand strategies. So you talk a lot about Kissinger and Brzezinski as, as you, you contrast them, saying Kissinger is the man who believes in this grand strategy, and Brzezinski believes in, in the specifics, in the context, in the contingent events. You can't just say, oh, he's a hawk, he's a dove. That's not how he worked. He looked at each case on its own merit. Sometimes he supported Republicans. Sometimes he supported Democrats. Sometimes he supported intervening. Sometimes not. This is a theme that I uh, is warm, near, near and dear to my heart, that when we talk of grand strategies, we're sometimes seduced by a siren song. Grand strategies have many frailties. Uh, you can miss the, the trees, and the trees are important in the details of foreign policy. So I think you agree with that, but I'd be interested to hear you talk more about that. And then third and finally, my personal research interest, as some of you may know, is in the end of the Cold War, the way that German reunification opened up a whole host of possibilities for political order in Europe and in the transatlantic world, and the reasons that we picked the transatlantic order that we now have, the reasons that we're we have the relations we now have with Europe and with Russia. Why did we pick those when there were so many alternatives available at the end of the Cold War? That's my own personal research interest, and I was therefore interested to see in your discussion toward the end of the book about that period, the 1990s, uh, that you raise questions about the wisdom of NATO expansion, mm -hmm. uh, which I sense uh, must have caused some disagreements with your subject, mm -hmm. and uh, to put it mildly. And I liked your phrase, your question, which in a sense you're asking the reader, but also Brzezinski, why should the United States uh, reinforce rather than dilute borders in Europe after the Cold War? To repeat, why should the United States reinforce rather than dilute borders in Europe after the Cold War? That was your question. I think it's a very trenchant one. I'd be interested to hear more about it. I was just saying we'll come back uh, for you to uh, answer these very interesting questions, but let's um, hear from David uh, first. David, of course, I think of all of us on the panel, you were probably the closest to Zbigniew and knew him best, but tell us how you reacted to the book. Well, what I uh, really admire about this book is that I think it was it was faithful to what a complicated person uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski was. Um, he was at once a man of ideas uh, and a man of power. Uh, he was a, a principled person who uh, thought that ideas mattered, but he was also uh, very much a, a, a pragmatist. He uh, believed that his relationship with Jimmy Carter had that personal relationship, the texture of it, 
had been central to what he accomplished uh, as national security advisor. Um, I think um, it's that richness uh, and, and uh, complexity of Zbig's life and career that um, makes him interesting and makes him worthy of study in this book, and I hope this is the beginning of, of people's uh, discussion and debate ab about uh, his career. Um, as, as Justin says, he, um, in one sense, uh, was uh, committed and courageous on the Middle East. He was very early to stake out his view that Arab, uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace was essential. He took enormous flack for it. Uh, he, he was uh, attacked uh, again and again, but he never really uh, wavered from that. It was it was a genuinely a courageous moment. We talk about profiles and courage in American politics. He was convinced this was necessary, and, and he was willing to suffer a, a lot of uh, criticism. Same thing with his opposition to the to the Iraq War. He had been a hawk. He's the sort of person he would have thought uh, would have supported the Iraq War, but but he had evolved in his understanding about America's ability to use military power. So by the time 2003 came along, uh, he said, this is not a good idea. He was a rare person with uh, Brent Scowcroft, most obviously, who spoke out uh, uh, and said, this, this is not a wise exercise. And at that time, it cost him something, uh, as, as his insistence on the importance of Arab-Israeli peace cost him something. Uh, it cost him, for a time, a seat at the center table because uh, everybody knew we were going to war. It just, it, it just was an axi axiom uh, of, of 2003 that this was going to happen. And Zbig said, no, it's not wise. It shouldn't happen. So um, I, I think um, uh, the book takes him seriously. It takes the issues in this complicated life seriously. I think Zbig would have loved the question that we're talking about and that just now focuses on. Do ideas matter? Um, and I think his answer would have been yes, but it, but power matters more, I think he would have said. I think that would have been his own assessment. Justin, you want to respond? <laughs> yes, perhaps I'll. Yes, perhaps I'll, I'll pick uh, uh, one or two uh, one or two points. Uh, you know, indeed, uh, the, the question uh, over whether ideas matter is an existential one because our uh, because we, <laughs> of course, for us, uh, for us think tankers and to some extent academics, but academics are in slightly different uh, position on this, I think, because the, uh, the aim of uh, the objective of, of science is not just to nourish policy making, you know, indeed, apart from certain uh, disciplines like political science, perhaps history and uh, sociology and a couple of others, uh, it's not the, uh, the, the, the principal aim. Whereas think tanks are supposed to create um, policy relevant research uh, certainly with academic standards, but still uh, uh, ideas that uh, that matter. And so the question is, I, so I was I was interested in this question my whole uh, intellectual uh, life, I would say. Um, my previous book was, uh, as you may know, A History of the Neoconservative Movement. Uh, was out in 2010. Um, and, and of course, uh, the question behind studying the neoconservative movement was to what extent did ideas matter relative to other factors, relative to other variables, as, uh, as political scientist uh, uh, jargon has it. Uh, and, and after that, I wanted to focus on uh, a more personal humane, uh, human uh, uh, level and see uh, and, and, and answer two questions. One was, where did Zbig's ideas come from? Uh, because he was so influential, it would be interested, I thought, to uh, understand what, by which processes did he form his vision of the world, his representation, his concepts, his, uh, his, uh, his strategy. Was it uh, because of his, uh, uh, because of what he, he, he did at, in the academic setting? Uh, because uh, uh, was it because of what he did at Harvard? Was it because uh, of what he wrote, the research he did? Was it because of identity? Was it because he was a, a, a Catholic uh, uh, American of Polish origin? Uh, so how much did identity matter? For example, he uh, was always extraordinarily hawkish on Russia. And of course, it's hard to think that that doesn't have a relationship with uh, his, uh, his identity. Uh, 
uh, and uh, he was always, uh, 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 you know, admitting that uh, that yes, he was uh, he was harsh on on, uh, on Russia, and that's a, a segue to the question on on, uh, on NATO. But uh, certainly, others who were not uh, Poles by uh, birth uh, were also hawkish on Russia. On Russia, so. Uh, and and then he was uh, he had different um, uh, views on Russia along his career. So identity doesn't explain everything. It's certainly part of the story, but it's not everything. So that was the first question. The second question was how much of his ideas were transmitted into into action, especially during the Carter administration. So it's not just uh, being an influential uh, intellectual, writing op-eds and pressuring uh, the debate in one direction. It's also uh, did he implement some of the ideas that he had formed before? And so, uh, so you're right, Frank. I go into the discussion. There's a literature on this. How much do ideas uh, matter to policymakers? How much of academic ideas are translated into actual policy? And 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 the conclusion is more than than mixed. Uh, that is to say, when you review things, especially on 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 questions of security. Um, my position is really one of a skeptic. That is to say, I, I do believe that the representations, concepts, uh, you know, mental images, etc., that we form uh, in think tanks, academia, etc., matter. But they matter in a very indirect way. Whereas templates, blueprints, strategies, etc., or, or you know, we were uh, just uh, uh, discussing um, uh, uh, game theory. Uh, uh, you know, think uh, Thomas Schelling, for example, the Nobel Peace Prize and the way he sort of theorized uh, the signals that could be uh, sent to the enemy and the supposed influence it had on military operations in Vietnam, like Rolling Thunder, etc. When you look at the evidence, uh, at the end of the day, you see that many times ideas would be serving more as window dressing or justification or ex post uh, uh, justification of uh, uh, of policies rather than as real uh, blueprint. So that's my that, that's probably my take. And 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 Brzezinski himself was insisting that his intellectual cap capital was was really important, but that academia had not given him uh, once again templates or uh, uh, or patterns uh, or, or blueprints to to uh, actually apply. He was also insisting, however, that intellectual uh, activity was important and 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 how much depleted was his intellectual capital when he left the White House after four years, after four years of working, uh, uh, you know, 15 hours a day and not being able to uh, uh, to sort of nourish himself. Um, speaking for too long, so I'll just pick one or two other uh, things on the title, um, uh, Mary. Uh, so in France, if you want to sell a book, you should put empire in the title or, <laughs> you know, or, or sex or something. So it was easier for me to put empire than sex. So I decided to put empire in the, in the, in the title. The I, president is helping you with that now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that's why. And, and in English, for somehow it didn't sound right. And I really hesitated using the term grand strategy because it has a meaning um, in international relation literature. And Zbigniew was always, as you said, uh, uh, skeptical uh, that such large uh, visions were really, really useful, was always very attentive to uh, context, to, uh, uh, yes, you're right, for example, he was, uh, he was very hawkish on Vietnam and supported uh, Vietnam, and he came to regret that afterwards. Uh, he was certainly generally hawkish during the Cold War against Russia. He was a dove on the Iraq War. Uh, he didn't uh, defend the Iraq War. He was a hawk on uh, the Balkans, uh, especially in 1995 and 1999. Uh, he was uh, a hawk on Afghanistan, but he was a dove on the Iraq War in 2001-2003. Uh, he was uh, a dove on. Uh, uh, he was a hawk actually on Libya in 2011, and he was uh, much more uh, dovish on Iran, etc. So, so the point here about military interventions is that uh, it's just to reinforce the, the the point you 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 made, which is that yes, he was really judging um, political situations on their uh, merits, uh, uh, all of uh, all of them. Um, uh, NATO expansion. Yep. Oh, NATO expansion. Y yeah, because. So, you know, during the 1990s, you had this big fight in Washington about NATO expansion uh, and, and whether it was a good idea or, or not. And indeed, uh, uh, Strop Talbot, my former, our former boss, uh, was, uh, uh, was, was advocating against this, especially in 1993, 1994, uh, and, and many were, uh, advocate, uh, were advocating uh, for it. Um, George Kennan, for example, always was opposed to NATO expansion, correctly predicting that it would lead to a, uh, uh, to a frustration and a resurgence of an aggressive uh, 
uh, Russia, and he laid it out in terms that uh, I think came out to be quite verified by uh, by what happened starting in 2007, probably with the uh, with Putin's uh, speech at uh, at the Munich Security uh, Conference. Uh, Zbig never had any regret about uh, NATO expansion, uh, thinking that. Um, uh, that uh, uh, in any case, Russia had to adapt to its new status and indulging, uh, so to speak, indulging Russia uh, in the idea that it was still an empire would not have done uh, much uh, for uh, the cause of uh, stability in Europe. So that's a decision he never regretted to have pushed very aggressively in favor of NATO uh, expansion, even though, of course, uh, you know, one can wonder if that was such a wise uh, decision. Stop here. Thank you. Can we just uh, get the others to, to focus on this question of um, uh, whether I ideas uh, matter? Um, Justan, you yourself have had the opportunity to take your intellectual capital into government, and so I'd be interested to hear from you uh, after the others about um, your own personal experience in, in that regard to the extent that you can talk about it. But uh, Frank and Mary, you're... you're well, I actually don't know. Have you been in government? Have either of you served in government? No. So you, you're more on the outside looking in. But what is, what is your sense of, of the relevance to policy of the, of the ideas that you are generating? I, uh, I had the honor to serve as a White House fellow. My first day as a White House fellow was September 4th, 2001. So the first week went okay. <laughs> Um, and then after that, I saw very much the maxim that is so made, made so famous by Henry Kissinger, which is that you accumulate your intellectual capital when you are outside of government, because once you are inside government, the events are so overwhelming that you're, you're working on what you know. Uh, so that was my own personal experience, uh, and I was therefore very struck uh, by your book, which in some way I thought went even further. Um, so Kissinger says, you know, you have this capital and then you're not going to add to it, but at least you'll use it. I was struck, uh, Justin, by your book, I believe on page 10. Uh, and this is admirably clear. You see this in academic writing. You see the same thought, but expressed with a lot of hedging and waffling. And uh, you've said very clearly to the question, uh, if we look at the social sciences, uh, we are faced with a striking conclusion. They seem to have no impact whatsoever on policymaking. This is what you say on page 10 of the book. So, you know, how do you really feel? <laughs> so um, I'm wondering, actually, I would like to ask you, now that you are in a position of authority in France, if you still see, think the same way that the person who wrote this book thinks. So I, I, I've thought about this a lot. Um, just saying it is this book was influenced by someone who was a mentor of mine, Bruce Kuklick, who wrote a book, Blind Oracles, that people may or may not be familiar with, but essentially uh, makes this argument that particularly in the Cold War, a variety of enormous resources were put into creating this intellectual infrastructure to understand national and international security, including um, the sort of great wizards of Armageddon. And uh, Kuklick's conclusion he comes to, with the exception, interestingly, of Kissinger and Kennan, is that the, uh, there used to be thought that these ideas had a, a negative influence, and he said it was even worse. They had no influence whatsoever, and it was a lot of hand-waving. Now, I actually think while that critique is important and should be recognized, I think it can be taken too far. And what one wants to ask themselves is in the situation that a policymaker like Justin and others face, of radical uncertainty, complexity, of a world of second best solutions, uh, what are you supposed to do? Throw your hands up in the air? Of course you want ideas to matter. If the choice is between throwing darts at a wall um, or just letting bureaucratic processes pursue path-dependent outcomes, of course you would want a world in which the best ideas matter. And there is no doubting that um, uh, the, the, the translation effect is difficult. But I also think if, if, again, being a historian, you put this in a broader historical context, if you ask the extent to which um, ideas 
look at something like figuring out aid in Africa, right? I mean, we have enormous amounts of knowledge about how to develop and deliver aid, when it's most effective, what kind of governance matters, how to put it, which nobody would have known 100 years ago, and is the result of academic research. You can, of course, turn around and say, you know, this is one of these hedgehog fox things, I think, that, that many of the bigger pronouncements, and I think Mary... Um, caution about grand strategy and uh, Brzezinski's caution about grand strategy is well taken. But I think that while we need to all be conscious of not overstating the influence of either the Cold War University or think tanks, to ask ourselves the counterfactual of what a world would look like where ideas were not being generated for better policy. Could we do better? Could ideas matter more? I, I've been someone who's been very critical of social sciences and the historical profession for not doing better. But that's based on the idea that I think ideas do make significant differences in producing better outcomes. Not all the time, because these problems are all, as Kissinger said, 5149 problems. You can have wonderful intellectual processes that lead to disasters and uh, really bad processes that read to good policy outcomes. Uh, but I think one wants to be very, very careful, and I don't think you do this in the book, you don't go anywhere near as far as Kuklet does, which I think is a, a, almost an anti-intellectual, it's all power, it's all process, it's all bureaucracy. I think both that's not true, nor should it be true. David, you're a long-timer observer of the interplay uh, between ideas and policy. What, what's your take? Well, I, uh, just two uh, uh, comments. Um, as I uh, watched uh, as a journalist uh, both uh, uh, Brzezinski and Kissinger, I was um, struck by uh, Kissinger's uh, attention to this day, to his own reputation in a way that often led him to um, trim his sails a bit, to avoid a confrontation with uh, a, a policy view. He, Henry uh, wanted, wants to be an advisor to administrations that change, and so um, sometimes maintaining that role and continuity um, has been important to him. Zbig um, was much more prepared to make, to, to, to pick a fight, to say what he thought. He, he felt that, I mean, his ideas changed, and as I say, uh, the question of how much he thought ideas in the end were decisive, is a, it's, it's complicated. But he did believe in expressing them quite forcefully and blunt, bluntly, and he didn't care if, if, if that cost him in a way that I, th I think um, Henry would never, just is more attentive to that. To make one other um, uh, point about, about this. Um, I had this uh, wonderful, uh, unforgettable opportunity in 2008 to sit with Zbig uh, and Brent Scowcroft and, and over a series of uh, a dozen or so conversations frame a book that was called America and the World, which was really just our conversations uh, edited and boiled down. And the interesting thing about this was that uh, two people, uh, one a Democrat, one a Republican, quite different uh, personal experiences, intellectual uh, styles, ended up coming um, to almost identical positions on the major issues. And the point that I want to make is that book, published in 2008, uh, laid out pretty much uh, the line that Barack Obama pursued in foreign policy. Uh, let's be careful of additional Iraq-like adventures. That certainly marked uh, Obama in Syria. Let's open to our adversaries. Let's deal with Iran and the reality of Iran and, and in, try to in, engage Iran. Zbig uh, talked a lot about the global political awakening, this thing that ended up uh, you know, being so visible in the Arab Spring. Zbig was very prescient, uh, as was Brent. They both saw it coming, and their, their advice would have been to engage it, not precisely as, as Obama did, but in many similar ways. So here were the, the two, uh, two of the smartest people I knew about foreign policy coming up with pretty much the same description of the world and series of recommendations. 
that then lead into the Obama presidency. And there is a, a broad sense that the Obama presidency, for all of his wonderful qualities and, and many um, in, in foreign policy would not be regarded right now as successful. So that's a real paradox for me. I, I, I have the greatest admiration for Brzezinski and Scowcroft. At the time, each of their ideas seemed sensible, but as it worked out, and this is, I think, an interesting question to really to think about, it, it didn't work out so well. Why? And that's something that I, I wish I'd had more time to talk with Spig about in the last few years. Shostat, do you have an answer to that? Uh, yes. I, I, listen, I do think that ideas matter. Uh, what, <laughs> what, what doesn't uh, matter that much is, and, and, and to be complete on the, uh, on the quote of, 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 page, uh, uh, of page 10, is, is the idea that um, w what I was writing is, um, but if we consider the social sciences in a narrow sense, that is, if we focus on the original theories, frameworks, and concepts developed by political scientists and historians and exclude those that merely confirm common sense, we are faced with a striking conclusion. They seem to have, to have no impact whatsoever. So my, my, my point or my attack or where I tend to follow Bruce Kuklik uh, perhaps a bit more than, than you do is really on these templates, uh, blueprints, theories, etc. Now, uh, expertise... Uh, including economic expertise, you mentioned uh, development, for example, uh, was not only valued by um, uh, by Zbig, uh, knowing what one is talking about, uh, indeed, and um, and 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 uh, cultivating that expertise uh, was uh, uh, not only uh, is important to formulate strategy, but also uh, does have an impact on uh, on the overall formulation of strategy. And and here, if I if I don't uh, buy, for example, that game theory had a direct impact on the Rolling Thunder uh, military operation in, in in Vietnam, then I I buy. Uh, at a larger plane, the uh, uh, the, uh, the the uh, the constructivist idea, that is to say, the idea that uh, 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 representation, concept, and others in general infuse uh, policymakers, infuse a, a, a foreign policy community. For example, the uh, uh, the words, the concepts that we exchange in uh, at Brookings, at CSIS, at AEI, in the Washington Post, in that in that milieu, they do matter. They um, uh, and they orient policymaking in a certain sense. Uh, so you see, my my uh, uh, criticism uh, has to do with uh, a more focused. Uh, interpretation of what social sciences uh, offer. L lastly, I would say that what my, my conclusion looking at, uh, at, at Zbigan, discussing that with him, is that policymaking and, and, and academia are just different arts, and uh, you can be very smart intellectually, etc. Uh, on the academic side, it doesn't necessarily help you uh, formulate policy. I mean, that's sort of a uh, and, and we have, um, uh, of course, many examples in, in, in mind. Uh, but, but even if you take American presidents from uh, Wilson to Obama, certainly you prefer presidents that are, uh, have high intellectual capabilities. Uh, but did they always formulate the best policy? That's you know, for anyone to judge. So we should amend it. It's not that ideas matter. It's conceptual thinking yeah. and strategy, strategic thinking yeah. Yeah. that matters. Uh, let's go to the audience and uh, we'll take your questions. Please uh, make sure to identify yourself, ask a question. So there should be a question mark at the end of your sentence and wait for the microphone. So we'll take one back there first. Bill, yes. <clears throat> uh, Bill Drozdak, Brookings. Congratulations, Justin, and welcome back, Martin. Thank you. Uh, projecting from... Um, your book, how do you think Zabig would assess our current predicament? Did, uh, did you come across anything that in which he might have anticipated uh, the retreat of America from a global leadership role after 70 years uh, uh, following World War II, and also uh, the rise of populist nationalism, uh, whether he feared that this would uh, jeopardize democracy? Um, uh, uh, sure. What he uh, his last tweet because uh, Zbig took to tweeting uh, towards the end of his life, and he had a very popular uh, Twitter account. Uh, he uh, read, "Sophisticated U.S. leadership is the sine qua non of a stable world order. However, we lack the former, while the latter is getting worse." 
that was his last tweet and I think the, 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 the tweet feed is still active and you can, uh, you can find it. So uh, the idea is uh, that uh, certainly he was in favor of an active US uh, leadership and uh, and you know and, and as for his reaction to, to Trump, he didn't join the uh, sort of never Trump bandwagon or uh, became excessively critical. What he wanted for, from Trump was, uh, was a strategy, was the articulation of general ideas that would guide uh, foreign policy. He was asking for an address that uh, would offer a bold statement of his vision, including his determination to provide America's leadership uh, in the effort to shape a more stable world. That was his uh, last op-ed uh, in, uh, in the New York Times. And criticizing you know, America first and, uh, um, and uh, make America great again as simple slogans that did not articulate any kind of, of policy. And so, uh, you know, from um, uh, China to the uh, current predicament of these days, that is uh, Syria and, and should the U.S. Uh, uh, strike or not, etc., I think what he would have insisted on was uh, thinking hard about what exactly we want to achieve, what are the resources uh, to do so, what are the... Um, uh, the uh, predictable uh, implications and consequences, and and then shall we strike or not? But as I, as I mentioned earlier, he would come out as a dove or as a hog, depending on the merits of each uh, uh, intervention. Uh, just a note to other panelists, if you want to jump in on any of these uh, uh, questions, please feel free to do so. Yes, please. Wonderful presentation. My name is Stephen Shore. My question is, did Brzezinski ever wish to become Secretary of State? And if so, why wasn't it offered to him? Uh, no, that's an interesting question. Uh, uh, I think he was, uh, and, and he uh, told me so, he was, uh, he was happy with the National Security Advisor uh, job because he valued very much his direct relationship with Carter. Carter trusted him. Carter followed, most of the time, followed his advice. And indeed, uh, in uh, November uh, 1980, when the results of the election came in, uh, Zbigniew actually thought that um, Carter would make it. Uh, uh, and, and he was intending to stay in his job uh, because he thought it would be um, uh, 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 better than, than being uh, Secretary of State. So, uh, and, and also remember that he was always a, someone who was controversial. He was uh, attacked uh, by many different uh, 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 parties and, and, uh, and lobbies in, in Washington. He was uh, contested. Uh, his hawkishness, for example, was uh, the subject of much criticism among, among Democrats. Indeed, that's why I mentioned he was uh, closer to the uh, neoconservative wing of the Democratic Party in the 70s, that is at the very beginning of the movement when neocons were all uh, Democrats, uh, that is to say very critical on détente, very critical of uh, relaxation of tensions with, uh, uh, with the USSR, very worried about the uh, evolution of the US, uh, USSR uh, power balance. And, and, so, and that's what he brought to the Carter administration, which was largely you know, infused with ideas, uh, with the evolution of the Democratic Party and the liberals in the U.S. after Vietnam, that is to say, in a very um, uh, not, I would say, non-assertive type of, uh, uh, of leadership, and even, uh, as uh, Zbig told me once, a bit pissnicky uh, about, about Carter, about Jimmy Carter, saying that he had tendencies that, that were sometimes a bit uh, pissnicky. That's how he, he described them. And so, uh, and so, and so of course, he was in, in opposition to that, especially the first two years. But then more and more, as the Cold War changed at the end of the 1970s and the tensions rose uh, with uh, uh, what was happening uh, in the uh, nuclear race, in Africa, uh, in, uh, uh, in Angola, in in Ethiopia, etc., and then most importantly in Afghanistan, starting in the cr Christmas 1979, then of course it sort of veered his way rather than Cyrus Vance's way, and, and it sort of justified or vindicated him as a hardliner, uh, and, and so that's why he would have stayed on, I think, as a national security advisor uh, during a second term of Carter, which never happened. Let's take one up the back and then we'll come up to the front. Yes, please. Thank you. James Siebens from the Stimson Center. Uh, I want to pull Europe into the conversation, if I may. Uh, something that Brzezinski talked about in Strategic Vision was that the unity of the West is not to be taken for granted. And he talked about the importance of pulling 
Russia and Turkey closer to the West. Um, would you please comment on the developments more recently and what Europe's position is on those two uh, thoughts of his? Um, sure. What, so he always had a, uh, a, a pretty positive view of European unity. He was a believer in European unity. Uh, he was always critical of the UK, uh, interestingly, for not being more active inside Europe. And of course, uh, uh, you know, Brexit was not such a big uh, uh, surprise, or the vote, uh, the uh, June uh, 2016 uh, vote was not such a big surprise uh, to him. So uh, Zbig died in May 2017, last year, uh, a bit less than a, than a year ago. So uh, he, um, uh, he witnessed the, uh, the Brexit vote and um, uh, election of uh, Donald Trump and, 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 and a couple of other uh, things. Uh, so he was always a very big supporter of European uh, uh, unity and a believer, but he also had a very geopolitical view that in, Eura in Eurasia, in the... Uh, in the eastern, uh, I'm sorry, in the western uh, part of that grand chessboard, to quote another book, uh, then Strategic Vision, uh, that um, uh, uh, in order to avoid the domination of one uh, one power, there should be uh, connections uh, uh, with uh, and should include uh, uh, especially the two important powers of that western part of the Eurasian chessboard, uh, Russia and Turkey, into uh, into Europe. Uh, indeed, the current situation is not very conducive to that. Uh, if we now talk about 2018 and the and the current uh, situation, uh, with um, uh, many more uh, frictions uh, uh, since um, uh, since not only the Georgian War of 2008, but of course the Ukraine uh, situation starting in 2014. And Zbig was always uh, relatively moderate on that. Uh, he thought that Ukraine should be uh, federalized and Finlandized. That is to say, uh, should uh, sort of um, uh, make some kind of comprom compromise with, uh, uh, with, with Russia and also should not uh, join uh, uh, NATO. And on that, he was uh, really on the same line as, uh, as Kissinger, uh, uh, the two of them so eye to eye on the, on the situation. And perhaps delivering defensive weapons uh, to Kiev, but certainly uh, not going uh, uh, further in uh, antagonizing uh, Russia. Uh, and I'll, I'll stop here. Um, you know, not uh, not that much on, on on Turkey, apart from the fact that being one of the uh, real countries, real uh, nation states of the of the Middle East and of the of the region, it should be uh, offered a greater role, not necessarily uh, into the EU, but 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 at least recognizing the status of of, of Turkey as an important player and, and a force for stabilization in the region. Justin, uh, my name is Oday Aberdeen. Part of Brzezinski's soul was anti-colonial. He was anti-colonial. Mm -hmm. And just go back to his support of the Algerian uprising against the French in 55, 56. Did he talk to you about this? Um, no, not really, but, but indeed uh, in his last article that was for the national interest, he insisted on that, about, uh, and it was uh, an article in, uh, on the Middle East, uh, and he insisted on the, uh, uh, the colonial um, trauma. Uh, but no, we never uh, talked about, uh, uh, about Algeria, uh, except that, of course, uh, one in his vision of the uh, 60s, 70s, and, and 80s, this idea of the uh, uh, awakening of the... Uh, uh, of the, of the uh, subjugated uh, uh, people and, and the uh, um, uh, anti-colonial movement, the independence, etc., loomed uh, large and was always integrated in his, uh, uh, in, his, in his vision. And indeed, of course, he wanted to use that against the USSR. Uh, for example, he did a, a, a trick with a, a colleague or a former colleague of yours, um, uh, 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 David, um, uh, who was um, uh, in 1958. Uh, so there was this... Uh, uh, World uh, Communist um, uh, Youth Festival uh, that was uh, happening in uh, 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 Budapest, and I'm, I'm forgetting. Yes, it was in uh, in Budapest. So uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was in Vienna, precisely. And so it was, and um, and uh, and what it did was a uh, was a stunt to sort of spoil to sort of bring ants to the picnic of the Communist Youth Festival because all countries had been invited. And so he led a delegation of students um, uh, to, that, uh, to that festival. 
and uh, Gloria Steinheim actually was 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 the leader of the of the group, interestingly. And uh, him and Walter uh, uh, Pincus, uh, um, yes, uh, it was him. Uh, I'm sorry, my memory um, uh, serves me badly, but uh, were uh, very active in um, in trying to uh, spoil and sabotage the the Congress. And what they did was they hung um, Algerian and Hungary uh, Hungarian. Uh, flags uh, in the main uh, place of event and then uh, fled and were not uh, caught, uh, managed to escape. But they, they, they had these huge uh, um, uh, Algerian and Hungarian uh, flags to make clear that the uh, anti-colonial uh, fight against uh, the French was, was uh, sort of mirrored by the uh, uh, Hungarian uh, fight for independence vis-a-vis -vis the USSR. Uh, unfortunately, our time is coming to an end, so I want to ask a closeout question, get all the panelists to address it, uh, and we'll have Justin uh, have the final word on this. But uh, as we look at events of today, since events were so critical in forming Zbig's approach to the world, uh, how do you think Zbig would have uh, reacted? What would he have recommended? that uh, the American president do about the situation uh, in Syria. Uh, David, you want to start us off? Well, um, so uh, two comments. First, generally, I think um, based on what Zbig said um, in the early months of uh, Trump's presidency, it's fair to say that he regarded uh, Trump with some horror. Um, I mean, there shouldn't be any mistake about that. Um, I think he was genuinely um, disturbed by uh, the uh, both the person and the ideas, um, and I think he worried about the deconstruction of the world that he had worked very hard to build. I mean, this big went, you know. T took different positions, but he, you know, the idea that there was this liberal international order, that there was this trilateral of power, that you sought to draw other countries into that, and 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 um, to, for the sake of stability, I think he believed in deeply. I think that's something he shares with with Kissinger is this idea of a structure of order um, that into which. Uh, uh, events and countries should be should be drawn. Um, I think uh, with Syria, um, he, he was uh, so disturbed by what happened in Iraq that that obviously marked him. But I, I do think he he worried that the outcome in Syria under President Obama had not been a, a positive one. Uh, I'd be surprised if he wouldn't have defended the use of military power a year ago. I mean, it was still alive, I guess. I don't, I don't know what he said publicly. Just now, maybe you do. Uh, he was in the last uh, week of his. Uh, I'm sorry. Last week of his life, and no, I'm not aware that he made okay. comments on that. But you know, I, I think defending the norm against use of chemical weapons would have been something that that he would have um, would would have endorsed. I like to think that he would have argued that um, being s simply being reactive, separate from a, a strategic idea of where you want to go in Syria, um, would be a mistake. Uh, I, I want to think that. I don't have a lot of evidence, but I'm just going to posit that, that what he would have recommended is, is taking some military action with allies. I think he would have like Trump's stress on working with France and other countries in whatever the U.S. does, but, but I think he would have said it has to be part of a, an idea about how you move toward greater stability in Syria as opposed to simply pop them. I, I defer to the expert on what Zabig would have said. I, um, I note, though, one of, the, another, one of the many interesting parts of your book was you point out the ways in which Obama ultimately disappointed Brzezinski and Syria was one of them. So even in the hands of a much more capable president, Syria is obviously a hugely intractable problem. Uh, my guess is that if, if, if you could somehow ask him now, he would probably say the real danger, it's not realistic that the Trump administration is going to solve Syria. And the short-term danger is actually a Donald Trump overreaction to what is happening 
in order to distract from Michael Cohen, Stormy Daniels. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not speaking on the basis of any information, but I can imagine he would very much like to bomb something, <laughs> to have something in the headlines other than Michael Cohen. Uh, so uh, I think that the Zabig would have said the real immediate danger is actually here in Washington, not in Syria. An actual solution is going to have to wait for a different administration. Uh, so it's hard it's hard to note specifically, but I, I think three points that comes out of comes out of Justin's book made me think about how he would make the decision. The first, um, I was very struck by how you showed Brzezinski far more sensitive to the changing nature of the world than Kissinger was. And whereas Kissinger saw things in terms of great chess point, chess games, set plays between great powers. Um, and I think David's point earlier about the awakening, I think Brzezinski was far more sensitive to um, uh, global changes that were going on and would have viewed this more through that lens. The second point is that uh, I think one of the reasons that Kissinger may have been more willing, I don't know how to put this politely, to, to uh, accept Trump is this darker vision of the world in international politics, which reading your book, I think Brzezinski um, didn't have. He actually... Uh, accepted um, some aspects of, I don't want to quite say exceptionalism, but he, he the, who the United States was and what it did in the world mattered quite a bit, uh, which leads to the third. I, I was also very struck by how you said he did things on a very case-by-case -case basis, so it's very hard to predict what he would have done. I think uh, Mary is and David are right that if you had asked three years ago as opposed to now, the answer would be different. But I think his greater concern uh, and fear and worry would have been both uh, the sort of increasing American retreat from the world and the kind of erratic reaction type of impulses that were shaping behavior. Where would that would lead to the actual decision today, uh, it's hard to know. But I, I am struck that he would have put a lot more uh, thought into it than I suspect we're going to get. Mm -hmm. Just that. Oh, perhaps a very short word of conclusion, because I think these were very, very good uh, points. The, the danger uh, laying in Washington rather than uh, elsewhere, uh, the idea that um, it was a, a case by case and that he should uh, uh, judge uh, uh, these things on their, uh, on their merit. I, I think that, um, uh, you know, to, 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 to just uh, continue on the point you were making, because he was an, uh, an immigrant, because America endowed him with the possibility, you know, the, the joke was that uh, at the end of the 50s, or early 60s, when, when Zbig really uh, started to become famous, etc., the joke among his friends was uh, that America is a country where you can, uh, when a, where a guy named Brzezinski can make a name for himself without having to change it. Uh, and he actually gave a brief uh, thought to changing his name uh, because it's unpronounceable or it's difficult to pronounce. And then he, he decided against it and... Uh, and it worked. Uh, it didn't. Uh, 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 it didn't uh, uh, um, sort of uh, didn't have to pay a price. And so, but the, the the larger lesson around this was that he was an Americanist in the sense that you have uh, uh, you know uh, uh, you have anti-Americanism or you have Americanism. And he was very much an enthusiast of uh, of American power. Became a citizen uh, very uh, uh, very enthusiastically, and always was on the a sort of positive or optimistic side of predicting America. So in the debate, so you know, America has every 10, 15 years has a debate about its decline. Uh, so there was a debate uh, in the uh, 70s. There was a debate at the end of the 1980s. You remember the Kennedy uh, book, The Rise and Fall of Great Powers. Uh, and so on that debate, Brzezinski was pretty much on the uh, positive, optimistic side. And then there was another debate uh, after the uh, financial crisis of 20 2008 and the aftermath of Iraq, uh, etc. And he was again uh, uh, in the uh, book that was mentioned earlier, a Strategic Vision, on the positive, optimistic uh, side of things. And so I subscribe to what you uh, you said, Frank, about the contrast, the other contrast with Kissinger, uh, who has a more, much more Spanglerian, uh, 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 and it's true, uh, even if he doesn't like uh, that to be to be mentioned, or he, uh, he denies that, uh, a much more pessimistic view of things, of democracy, uh, of the way democracy can be subverted. And here again, we're back to the question of ideas and identity. Uh, because, uh, uh, because after all, uh, you know, Kissinger's own uh, youth uh, 
uh, largely predisposed him to think in these terms of, uh, uh, of pessimism on democracy, on the uh, possibility of keeping uh, the uh, vital center, etc. Uh, whereas uh, uh, Brzezinski uh, uh, bought the American dream, in a sense, and, uh, and thanks to that, um, I think, uh, contributed greatly to America's relation uh, with the world uh, uh, over the past decades. Well, you'll have to you'll have to uh, applaud again in one moment. Uh, but I uh, I think that the passing of uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski is the passing of a of a great American strategist, as as just Dan has outlined in his book, the likes of which we may not see again. And therefore, this book is is a great uh, analysis and account of the works of this uh, great strategic thinker. So I hope you will buy the book outside or on Amazon. And please join me again in thanking not only Justin but also the panelists for a great discussion. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.